At the turn of the century, two intrepid explorers set up camp at the end of the world. And there in a little area tucked away is this tiny little building. As you approach it, you see the stables, you see the wheel from the first vehicle ever used in the Antarctic. And as you enter that door, it's all before you. The picture of the king and queen of England, the ham still hangs on the wall. That's Nigel Watson, executive director at the Antarctic Heritage Trust, speaking with the BBC about a recent effort to preserve an important piece of early 20th century history. A series of buildings, cabins really, built in Antarctica by legendary explorers Ernest Shackleton and Robert Falcon Scott. Through our conservation work, we've had some magnificent discoveries, probably the most famous of which has been the whiskey that was left behind by Shackleton and his crew underneath the wooden floors. Despite its remote location, the site is attracting a lot of attention from tourists. Those with the fortitude to endure the three, sometimes four-week journey from New Zealand to Antarctica will see firsthand this unique collection of 100-year-old wooden huts the first to be built on the world's last uncharted continent. Welcome to the PEMcast, conversations and stories for the culturally curious. From the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, I'm Chip Van Dyke. And I'm Dinah Carden. This is the second episode in a series about our historic house crush campaign, We're looking at historic buildings from different angles and asking our listeners to share architectural finds on Instagram and the like with hashtag historic house crush. You know, if people are spending four weeks on a boat to visit a bunch of cabins in a barren wasteland, then it's pretty clear that there's some kind of draw to buildings that can tell stories. In this episode, we talk with people who are pushing the envelope, to use a building term, on presenting historic houses to the public. They're changing the way these houses are run and the way we experience them. You'll hear unexpected stories about cocktails, chamber pots, and one-night stands. It's not what you think, but stick around. I've thought for a long time, a beautifully done house museum is like you know, Merchant Ivory movie set. But we don't have the storyline that's written in a way that a movie script is written because it doesn't have that emotion. And all good movies are about, seem to be about emotion. Joel LaFever is the director of the Museums of Old York, a collection of historic buildings and properties in York, Maine. This is a very busy road for... Uh, uh, they're all going to York Beach. It's, a, it's <laughs> what people do here in the summer. <laughs> Before he took the job in York, Joel was a consultant for historic house museums. I think a big part of the move in museums now, house museums, is to create experiences. And a lot of times that is food or it's music or it's having a different perspective on the tour. He told me about his recent work with a museum that was in danger of being shut down, the Alexander Ramsey House in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's beautifully maintained, all original collection, on a beautiful Victorian park in a city. But it was completely disconnected from the neighborhood. They really needed to start having an interpretation that wasn't about kind of Victorian domestic life. Joel worked with the museum to imagine what a reinterpretation might look like. They started doing something they called History Happy Hour. It was about daily challenges of life then and now. History Happy Hour covers any topic from the time when the family lived in the house, the late 1800s to the 1960s. Prohibition, the sexual revolution. This October, they're discussing the history of horror movies. And so they have guest speakers come in and give a lecture and they have a drink. It's been extremely popular. It sells out because now the interpretation isn't about Sorry, but lace underwear and sugar cookies. People enjoy it, and it's more relevant. I asked Joel if there were any other historic house museums we should visit that have adopted this approach to connecting with people. There are places that I know that I've been that seem to be more about the emotion. One is the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in New York. They don't have a lot of what's in their collection comes from eBay because they're creating very working class interiors. Very little is precious, so it's more about the emotion that the story of the people is telling than it is we have their chair, you know. 
We wanted to learn more about the Tenement Museum firsthand, so we sent Dinah on assignment to New York. It was a humid summer day in the Lower East Side of Manhattan when I joined up with my tour group. Would anyone like a fan before I go on? We call this old school air conditioning. Come on in if you like, you're welcome to sit. You can sit in any fan that you want. Any fan that does not look historic. Okay, we're going to go back to the Tenement Museum. Okay, we're going to go back to the Tenement Museum. Okay, we're going to go back to the Tenement Museum. The Tenement Museum is housed in an old tenement building at 97 Orchard Street in Manhattan. Between 1863 and 1935, the building was home to nearly 7,000 poor and working class immigrants. So friends, now we are actually looking at an apartment. So note, we've got three rooms here. We've got a bedroom, the kitchen, and then the parlor. All together, these three rooms are about 325 square feet or 31 square meters. Dinah, I'm terrible at imagining rooms in square feet. Just how big is that? OK, if we're looking at a 325-square-foot living room, you might say, that's a comfortable living room. Now, divide that into three rooms. How many people do you feel like you would be able to live with comfortably in an apartment this size before someone needed to move out? Six. You could live with six here? Yes. All right. <laughs> I love it. On average, there were about six people for every three-room apartment. At its most crowded, there were as many as 12. I was struck by how the Tenement Museum is exactly as it was left when the tenants were evicted. Here in Salem, many historic homes are sort of fancy. Pem's Gardner Pingree House, for instance, boasts carved mantelpieces, a grand staircase, and plush canopy beds, the life of one wealthy family. While the Tenement Museum, with its peeled wallpaper, cramped living quarters, and humble furnishings, celebrates the lives of many families struggling to get by in a new country. One would be hard pressed to kind of describe this particular building or any of the architectural details as indicative of a you know, particular architectural movement. In fact, we don't know who the architect for this building was. This is Dave Favaloro, director of curatorial affairs. Dave started at the Tenement Museum in 2004 and had a chance to work with one of the founders, Ruth Abram. You know, Ruth in particular talked about how she really envisioned a place where Americans of a variety of backgrounds could kind of come together and understand uh, the ways in which their ancestors contributed to this being uh, a nation of immigrants. He told me about the moment the founders of the Tenement Museum first discovered the building at 97 Orchard Street. They weren't able to find uh, a building and decided instead they were going to look for rentable, leasable storefront space while they searched for the appropriate building. They were searching for a building that had a long history of housing immigrants. There was a for rent uh, sign in one of the storefronts here at 97 Orchard Street and came to look at the space and was led out into the main entry hallway of the building, which really, even at that point, was left in the state. It was in when all of the tenants were evicted in 1935. They had found their tenement and within it, the evidence of those who had lived there. And we found things like tickets to a nearby synagogue that no longer exist for high holiday services, uh, advertisements for English classes that are written in Yiddish. Uh, one of my favorites is a, um, what at the time was called a premium coupon. I grew up in the 1980s, right? And so they were like the proofs of purchase from cereal boxes, which were written in Italian and English, and you could exchange them for like a set of drinking glasses. The Tenement Museum connects the past to the present and helps visitors appreciate the continued role immigration has played in shaping America's identity. They also offer teachers innovative ways to introduce students to the complex issues surrounding immigration. I've been struck by some of the comments and perspectives of our uh, international visitors who, in places like Europe, right, they're just beginning to kind of grapple with um, immigration and, and what that means and, and, and for their own sort of countries and societies. There was, you know, immigration debates when I started here in 2004, and they've, they've reached a kind of pitch now, right? Uh, and I think people want to talk about these things. They want to talk about um, the role of immigration in the United States today, and we, I think, have long felt that a reference to the past uh, in a space that evokes those stories of immigrants a um, hundred years ago or more really helps to create kind of a safe space for having those those kinds of conversations. We used to come here all the time with my mother. She used to give us a treat. We used to go to Cats and she used to buy hot dogs and divide it in two and Kanish. <laughs> that was an amazing treat. At the Cats Deli down yeah, the street. Yes, yes, yes. This is Georgina. Let me say it in Spanish better. Georgina. 
Acevedo, Babilonia. She works at the Tenement Museum. I'm the financial administrative manager. And has lived in the neighborhood her whole life. The locals were the locals. Like if you they were uh, Jewish, they would have Jewish culture. And then in the 60s, I think, you know, to what I recall, it started to sort of slowly change. And then we had a lot of delis that were called bodegas, and that was Latinos bodega. Every culture, uh, every immigrant that comes to the city, especially the, this big city, they try to always go to an area that, that will have their food, the culture, the language, the people. And in the museum, it has all of that because it represents all immigrants. It's nice to talk to somebody who grew up here. After leaving the Tenement Museum, I headed out onto the streets of Lower Manhattan to meet up with Frank Vagnone. It's Franklin Vagnone, and I am president of my own cultural consulting firm, Twisted Preservation. Frank is a bit of a rebel in the historic house world. He's even written a manifesto on the subject called The Anarchist Guide to Historic House Museums. I feel like what we've done is we've leaned so far to the side of presenting them as kind of art museums, curated decorative arts spaces. We've got the ropes and everything is so curated and so clean and there's no smells, no sounds, and everything's fed to us with the tour guide, with the guided script to tour. So places like the Tenement Museum can take us into that tactile realm, both physically as well as kind of cognitively. Frank was also the director of the Historic House Trust of New York City. He now travels the world to promote new ideas about historic house interpretation. One director of a historic house museum complimented Frank by saying, you've derailed my understanding of what this place is about. Frank told me the story of when a brick was thrown through the window of a historic house in Philadelphia. That's absolutely true. Um, uh, that's Grumblethorpe in Philadelphia. And I went there because I wanted to figure out how to repair it and all of that. And I realized very quickly that there were some issues because we thought we were doing a really good job. But clearly the neighborhood didn't think that we were doing a good job because they didn't value it as a community resource. So Frank changed the whole idea of engagement at Grumblethorpe to reflect the house's history as an agricultural estate. We kind of closed it to walk-in visitors, opened it to scholars, changed the gardens into vegetable gardens, um, and invited neighborhood kids to start a farmer's market, work up the business plan, actually run it. That's a kind of example of how a house museum can really engage the community in a very meaningful way and still be true to its narrative. Most recently, Frank has been blogging about visiting historic house museums when no one else is there, at night, in his pajamas. He calls them one night stands. I just picture you like in your little slippers yes. and your pajamas. Yes. I mean, truthfully, I get in my jammies, um, I'll go and make tea, I'll sit in the living room using the furniture, using the collections, um, experiencing the house and the spaces in the way that they were originally intended. At the Hull House um, in Lancaster, New York, it's an 1810 dwelling and there's no bathroom in it and I use the chamber pot. But Frank's not seeking to recreate an historically accurate experience. He doesn't check his contemporary life at the door. One of the things you'll notice in my pictures is I've got my computer sitting on the desk, I've got my iPhone by my bed. The issue that I'm trying to bring up is how these historic sites can inform my contemporary life. Frank believes that most visitors to historic homes never get a real sense of what it's like to live in that space. You really get no sense that people walked around in their bare feet and drank coffee and tea and went to the bathroom and slept there. And, and that's one of the reasons why the one night stands are so important. And if you read my blogs, I'm constantly struggling with conveying the tactility of the experience that I've had. The nighttime is the best time. The nighttime is the best time. When you stand in the museum, in the middle of the museum, in, you know, in the hallway, like you could actually literally imagine going back in that time, seeing the people. Like if you really pay close attention, I don't know if you're spiritual or not, but I, I get it all the time. You could imagine like the family, the woman, you know, the work, the laughter, the cries. There were so many things that happened in that place that it happens nowadays.
that's our show. Thanks for listening. Special thanks to Joel at the Museums of Old York and Dave, Georgina, Annie, and everyone over at the Tenement Museum. Thank you to Frank Vagnone. Find Frank and more info on his One Night Stand series at twistedpreservation.com. Find the show notes for this episode, along with pictures and links, on our blog, connected.pem.org. And for more on the exciting Shackleton and Scott story, check out episode 38 of Lore, a terrific podcast from one town over in Danvers, Massachusetts. Host Aaron Menke uses the recent discovery of the Shackleton whiskey bottles to tee off a truly eerie true story of an unexplainable mystery in the tundra. Listen to the PEMcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. In our next episode, we conclude our Historic House Crush series when we talk with some exceptional Historic House Crushers, those that have taken their love of historic homes to the next level. Producers for this episode are myself, Dinah Carden, Karen Baim, and Whitney Van Dyke. Corbett Sparks is our audio engineer. Melissa Woods was our script consultant. Tosha Tuhart was our production assistant. And finally, here is Frank Bagnone with an important message. So go ahead, everybody, tweet, hashtag, Historic House Crush. <laughs>